Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, and thank you very much for coming uh, tonight to the in, uh, to the International Game Developers Association Learning, Education, and Games Special Interest Group uh, Town Hall. So uh, there's a really long acronym for that. Uh, just so you all know, this is going to be recorded uh, for posterity and so that we can post it to the IGDA website and to uh, YouTube and all that and share it with our colleagues who might not have been able to be here. Um, and I'd like to introduce myself and uh, some of the board members uh, and the ones that are here who could make it tonight can, of course, introduce themselves. We'll, we'll call. Um, and uh, so uh, to start off, my name is Ken Thompson. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Connecticut. Uh, I teach game design there. Uh, before that, uh, and, and I, I also work on, as far as research goes, on uh, bringing humanities topics to the general public, uh, as well as I've worked on some NSF grants um, and, and, uh, and one NIH one as well. So I've got some experience with that. Before that, I came from industry, uh, where I was working mostly on handheld games at uh, Vicarious Visions and uh, Grip Tonight Games. Um, and uh, uh, probably the first time I, I ever kind of had a connection with learning in, in games was when I taught my little brother how to read using Lunar the Silver Star, if anyone ever played that a long time ago, because um, he was not a big reader and uh, the quests were all there. So, uh, and uh, Elena, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Elena Bartazzi. I'm the director of the program, the Game Design and Development Program at Quinnipiac University. I've been involved on this steering committee for a really long time. And I hope that we're going to be able to get together and do some cool stuff together. Um, I work mostly in um, behavior change games. So I work with scientists and doctors. The last couple of years, I've been working in India on games that collect information, collect data about family planning intentions and teach um, sex ed and uh, how to use good forms of birth control. So we have a little company called solitonsgames.com where we're also working on some other projects as well. So welcome. Awesome, and Sherry? Hey everyone, I'm Sherry Jones and I'm new to the steering committee. Um, so I teach also game design and psychology at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. Um, I'm also involved with the ISTE Games and Simulation Network where we uh, provide information for educators from K-12 to college on how to use video games in teaching. My particular division is that I, I started with uh, teaching philosophy using games, and I've done many video series that are available online that's free for anyone to access, so that's, that's my entryway. And I also have a little um, game design company called Social Good Engine LLC, where we are developing games that promote critical thinking. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, and we also have several board members who weren't able to join us to, tonight, um, and they'll be coming in and out at different uh, events, I'm sure. Uh, we have David Simpkins, Associate Professor at Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, as well as Toby Saulnier, CEO of First Playable um, and uh, in Troy, New York. Um, so a lot of New Englanders, uh, except for Sherry here, uh, who can uh, kind of pin down the West Coast for us. Um, but not to say that, uh, you know, everything happens only in the Northeast, just a uh, strange coincidence, I think, this year. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mark was not able to be here tonight. Mark Ruppel, he was going to be here, but uh, had a medical uh, emergency that he had to take care of. Um, and uh, he, however, has given us a rain check, and we will definitely be asking and inviting him to come along later on um, and give us a talk, and as well as talk about some of the ways that uh, developers can uh, get access to certain funds, like the National Endowment for Humanities has the Digital Projects for the Public grant, um, as well as others uh, in that area, um, and he's uh, aware of other things as well. So perhaps maybe we'll get together a, a panel of um, different grant agencies maybe that can be one of our next goals. Um, so uh, it, also, if you haven't ever been with us before, we have a couple links um, that I'm going to add uh, into the chat in a second um, in terms of places where you can connect with us. Uh, this is, and this is all things that are getting up to, uh, updated as we go along this month. So this is our, um, 
there we go. So this is our IGDA page. So if you're not already a member, there's links and of course for uh, becoming an IGDA member, not required of course, but um, uh, something that we love to see if uh, you're really getting into it. Uh, and we also have a lot of different ways to connect. Uh, we have some Facebook, which we've been using primarily. Uh, however, we've gotten some feedback about how we can uh, expand our communication to other places and we're just getting uh, going. So these links here, which should all work, there we go, um, are uh, our social media. These also, when uh, gets posted to YouTube, we'll put this down below. Um, uh, these links are where you can get at us. Um, and Elena, do you have something to share? Yeah, they're, they're, they're not showing up in the chat, Ken. Oh, really? Oh, are you good. sending them to everyone? Uh, you know what, I must be sending them privately, but that's why yep, we there. are a team. Yep. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you, appreciate it, everyone. All right, let's try that one more time. I had it on my other screen. And I could yep, not there see we go. It. Now they're coming up. Great, awesome. Lovely, okay, great. So, um, so those are a, a bunch of different ways that you can uh, connect with us and uh, we'll be probably trying to uh, set up a, in a Twitter as well if that's something that people are interested in. Um, and uh, as well as we're gonna, um, uh, talk about some of the results of the survey. Uh, I, you know, uh, if you would like actual numbers, I can get into that and release an email later on. But um, I really appreciate anyone who gave feedback. Uh, that was really helpful in helping us kind of figure out where we should steer the boat, so to say, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, and we had uh, a lot of interest in game jams um, and supporting game jams as well as published books. Um, and actually maybe not as much of an emphasis on setting, making webinars. Um, so that'll be interesting to kind of talk about uh, all together as a town hall. So um, I'd be interested to hear everyone's feedback. Um, tonight is basically for, a, a, a gives us all an opportunity to meet each other for maybe the first time in a while. Uh, and I would love to discuss kind of strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities we have as learning, as uh, educators and developers. Uh, and uh, what opportunities in the field do we have? Uh, what should we be focusing on? Um, I don't expect this to necessarily last all the way to 8.30, but uh, uh, the, you know, a, a rousing discussion may occur, you know. Uh, <laughs> so if it is your first time speaking, um, uh, I'd love it if you could please briefly introduce yourself. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you can, uh, just say what you need to say. And I think we're probably in a small enough group that we can all kind of unmute and uh, kind of monitor that. But if needs be, we can start reverting to a, I can, you know, moderate more and call on people. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's about all I want to say. I want to make sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I think the first thing that I wanted to cover is uh, um, how are you all responding? Uh, hearing about or learning about uh, ways people are applying um, educational technologies in the fall. Um, I'm sure that the, you know, with uh, a lot of distance learning and that kind of stuff, uh, is there any, has there been any discussion or you've been working on things like that? I'm going to bring my chat room chat bar to the other side. Well, I know that I just spent many hours um, doing an obligatory online um, teaching course, um, which w was great in the sense that it showed how people are using things like Flipgrid. And you know, the idea is to, if we have to do this online again, to do it in a much more engaged and engaging way. And so I think it really, for me, I'm sad your university decided not to let you use anything, but um, but you know, the official channels, because I think as game designers, um, we can really use games in very creative ways to actually have our classes inside of games or, or use um, the fact that we can't touch each other as a constraint uh, to make the experience more interesting. So I know that in my intro game classes, we always play games together, physically play games together. That's an important part of how we meet each other. And so I'm imagining that we're gonna be in a room there are only going to be five of us and the rest of the class is online and the five will have little rakes to move, um, you know, game pieces on a board and then they'll be counseled by the five people. I don't know, you know, I think we're just going to have to be really creative about how we make it work. Yeah, but, I've seen some digital, uh, uh, yeah. some people taking their classes into like Minecraft and stuff for K-12, yeah. so. Yeah. 
Is everyone, can we go through and have introductions from people? Because I don't yeah, know if everyone here is an educator or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can um, we start but, with Matt or, yeah, Matt or Matt Arnold, do you want to go ahead? Sure, sure. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, Matt Arnold. This is the first time I've uh, joined one of the uh, the meetings for the group, and um, happy to be here this evening. Um, I'm a, a digital learning manager for ECPI University. It's actually out in Virginia, um, but I'm based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So um, I'm working from home, and um, I actually lead a small team of, uh, of game developers at our university that develop um, just some small um, web-based games and, and simulations and stuff using Unity um, for a lot of our, our curriculum and stuff. And so as our university went a lot virtual, we've had a higher demand for simulations and digital type games and things like that. What can we do? What can we use in the classroom? And so we've been facilitating a lot of that and helping with the faculty and uh, finding out what they can do to virtually connect with students, and we think games is a great way to do that. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's what that's what we've been working on, and uh, that's a little bit about me. What would you like to get out of this group? What would be the most useful thing for you? Um, I would really like to see how others are using uh, games and that in just other institutions, other um, if if they're developing them in-house? Are they using different games that are already out there on the market? Uh, we're, we're, we find that we have trouble sometimes finding um, games that are specifically meeting our curricular needs uh, at times. So we're, we're developing some things ourselves, but then also helping instructors find things that are already out there and um, that are already pre-developed that they could utilize in their classrooms. So it's a, it's a mixed bag of both. And so I'm just curious, you know, how other institutions are doing that. But um, also um, interested in getting more involved in, in just uh, game development overall and how that um, uh, looks in our uh, looks in the field of education. I think it's a growing and booming area, and I think there's a lot of institutions that are interested in doing things sort of similar to what our university has been doing with um, developing some in-house games and things like that. From what I've talked with other institutions, so do you find that um, there's uh, science or technology is mostly what you've been focusing on, or is it uh, across the board? Or I would say mostly science and technologies. Um, our universities focus more in the in the STEM area. We have some business college uh, courses. We have um, some programs in criminal justice. But our our primary primary goal is uh, cybersecurity, uh, computer science. Uh, we also have engineering school, um, things like that that we uh, that uh, that we have at our university as well. Yeah, I, re I remember playing a, a widget making game in Excel and a business class once. So, uh, <laughs> business is a little uh, uh, lower tech, which is really great too. So, uh, how about uh, anyone else? Josh, I see that uh, you, you've got your camera on, so I'm going to maybe pick on you. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and what you're looking to get out of things? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, is the voice working okay? It's perfect. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at UC Davis in computer science and uh, cinema and digital media. Uh, I research artificial intelligence applied to character interaction, particularly making models based off sociology for characters to act expressively in worlds. Um, and I teach game design uh, as well as gameplay programming uh, in both the computer science and the cinema and digital media settings. Um, in particular, gameplay platforms through Pico 8 has been a, a fun class to teach recently. Um, what I'd really like to get out of this SIG, I guess I'm still trying to figure it out. It's the first time I've uh, uh, got to hang out with you all, um, is really uh, coming at it from like sort of like the, uh, the research angles that I come from, what sort of stylized mental models, what sort of uh, fictional recreations or approximations are players sort of like taking away from a game and its mechanics through play. Uh, sort of like what sort of mechanics and models are people building in their heads um, after they come away from it. I, the, something close to the research and a, a sort of like a, a how do things really connect together with play and, and, and education is really what it comes down to. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, sort of like the, the central locus here. Fantastic, awesome. Um, how about how about David? David Payne. Oh, can you hear me? We yep. can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, great. Sorry, just getting my video going there again. Uh, I'm actually just an uh, instructional design student, um, just starting graduate school this year, um, but did some uh, studies undergrad with that and then game design and other media development. And um, I'm trying to actually figure out which pathway of main, three main possibilities I have most interested in, whether it's in the research direction, helping advance what's known about what works, or in the possible writing journalism direction and promoting the field, helping that, helping things advance that way, uh, possibly critique or creating in that sense or whatever, and then uh, and then the making um, more examples of what really works. I'm leaning toward the last um, with the other two kind of on the side kind of thing or possibly getting into it sounds like a lot almost everyone else here might be uh, in higher ed um, towards the possibility down the road if I go further education wise and that kind of thing but um, basically I was at the serious play conference online this year um, attended in person a couple of years ago and also just went to the G or you know attended the G4 the games for exchange one this last week and um, at the serious play one there was a lot of talk about a uh, um, serious uh, games or there was there was a session about a talk about a serious games uh, trade organization I don't know if anyone attended that or was familiar or, or heard about that or whatever but or like uh, an association that's like a GDA, but focused on educational games, serious games. Um, and again, I'm thinking about, I mean, I, I'm most, what I'm most interested in, I guess, and this is my first time obviously here too, or checking out what you guys are doing and what it's all about. But the uh, one thing that's most interesting to me is uh, what's possible in terms of like a larger systems type of uh, development that might help uh, the field advance, whether it's um, tied into things like a marketplace for educational games or some ways of um, having um, standards that might be somewhat universalized or or, or pluralistically <laughs> combined or whatever. But um, basically, uh, that's kind of my I'm, I'm all the three directions I mentioned before are kind of uh, in the idea of, of trying to find some ways to help the potentials of all of this that everybody's working on kind of tides rise to lift all boats kind of thing is what I'm interested in. So that's, that's the way I'm right now. Awesome. <laughs> rambling. No, no, not at all. That's yeah, really sure great. Still there? Yeah, we're still here. I'm can can you... Elena? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, I didn't know if I was, Okay, gotcha. No, that's that was really great. Thanks, David. Um, and uh, sure. I didn't mention I'm at uh, in Illinois, Western Illinois University. is just a, it's an instructional design program. That's the closest thing I had here. They do related. There's like one course in games, one course in um, simulations, and one course in VR, and the rest is all over the place. But pulling that in from other other sources basically the game side of it but anyway yeah no that's that's really awesome and instructional design is absolutely something there's a lot of crossover with game design at least once you know i i encountered instructional designers working on some online courses so um there's there's a lot of uh similarity um i think that's one of the nice things about this Per, uh, um, uh, SIG is specifically we're kind of crossing over with educators as well who are not necessarily game developers specifically and it's kind of uh, where you know um, we intersect a little bit with uh, the general public as well uh, so that's really great um, uh, how about Matt Matt Arnold um, if you'd like to introduce yourself oh I'm sorry we already did that excuse me uh, I you moved you're moved over um, Alan, Alan <laughs> Mitchell Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Alan Mitchell. Uh, this is my second time at a educational SIG. The first time uh, I was going in just kind of looking for opportunities and I'm still kind of looking for opportunities. Um, I just dropped my first semi-educational game uh, called Pebble Pirates, 
which is a um, it is a pirate themed Moncala game, which Moncala um, has been used in the classrooms all around the world to teach kids how to count from an early age. So, yeah, I'm kind of surprised to see that there isn't more, um, I guess, traction, being that everything is kind of moving online, because right now everything is kind of like in a medium state, like no one really knows what's going to happen in the fall. So, I don't know. I'm just, I'm here looking for opportunities and... Maybe there will be some, maybe there won't, but I'm here. That's great. Alan, uh, did you mention where you were based out of? Oh, Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Or warm, I guess. So. Uh. <laughs> not, not many game devs out here, but there are more than I thought. So. Yeah, yeah. There was um, a couple studios at one point. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, the Arizona scene is now, but I had a few colleagues who were over there. Um, so it is not bereft. Um, certainly, Connecticut is, uh, you know, at least equal. So. <laughs> yeah, we have Rainbow Studio. Last time I checked. Ah, yeah, yeah I think that might have been the one. So. Yeah. Uh, great. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan uh, Rios. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. My name is Jonathan Rios. I do not have a webcam. This is a newly built computer. And so I didn't bother to think I was going to need a webcam because I built this in January of 2020. Uh, so that's completely unexpected. I am, my day job is completely unrelated to uh, what this is. Uh, but independently in my own time, I am a uh, educational game designer slash researcher. So uh, I, what, what's, what's, um, my mind is currently occupied at the moment. I'm still, I'm still on shift. I'm still on call, but I wasn't going to miss this. Uh, before COVID happened, before uh, any of this craziness happened, I had a, I have a strong impression that there's an untapped educational power. There's a teaching power in video games that is pretty much unharnessed in the field of education. And what I want to do is, well, what I am doing is I'm researching a bunch of different video games, how they teach their students or how they teach their players and reformatting it into a way that I could turn it into academic content. Now, after COVID happened, and after seeing a whole lot of different educational software being pushed out rapidly, it's like, okay, you know what? Uh, educational game designing is going to take too long of a turnaround time, uh, especially when I'm still, since I'm a one-man team, I, I got to produce all the art, the assets, and uh, the mechanics. So currently what I'm doing is I'm going to, I'm reviewing educational video games. So I have a list of uh, where's my, I have an Excel sheet of like a hundred or so video games where I play them as long as I can. I write a script and I produce a video to put it on YouTube to say, this is their educational prowess, right? So, uh, just like, this is video before I begin ranting. Yeah. So I know everybody here is figuring out which games to use. And I want to provide some clarity to say, you should use these games because these games are the most successful for these particular reasons. Now, I'm not rating on a typical like consumer scale, like, oh, it has amazing graphics, oh, it has amazing sound design, or it has crazy good voice actors, or it's been endorsed by Apple. I, it's, uh, the criteria I have is things like feasibility. How easy is the game to set up? Uh, the mechanical complexity. If this is a game meant for children to play, how complex is it to even start the game? Um, a lot of people here, I'm sure all of us here are capable of playing Minecraft pretty easily, but for children that don't play video games, it's the first big hurdle for them is moving along with moving their camera. Doing yeah. that simultaneously is a huge, huge challenge. And a lot of kids get turned off, or rather a lot of adults get turned off playing a game like that 
when they have no ex prior experience. So these are things I would take a look at. Of course, along with like the teaching ability of the game, subject matter accuracy, pedagogical score, and you know, is the game fun? <laughs> Am I, is this game like a glorified quiz? Chocolate covered broccoli is the famous saying, or is it, is it something special uh, to incorporate into your classes for whatever subject? What do I expect out of this meeting? Uh, I don't know, anything. Uh, a job would be nice, but uh, it's, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing my thing until uh, something comes up. Yeah. And, and by job, do you mean, um, are you looking for like employment in a, in a place or are you looking for contract work in the same way kind of Alan is, uh, I believe? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a mixed bag. Yeah. I'm a mixed bag of skills, the designing, the researching, the drawing, the, uh, it's, what? it's, it's weird. <laughs> I got video editing equipment. Okay. I got experience under that. I have a question. What's up? In the American U.S. system, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, you're good. Yeah, we, we hear you loud and clear. Oh, I'll, I'll be back with an actual answer in a bit. It's 10 seconds. <laughs> well, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, I have some teaching experience, just a little bit. Yeah, a catalog of rating games to help teachers figure out. That's what I want to provide. Like, like uh, people compare Oregon Trail as the magnum opus, and Oregon Trail is very good. It is excellent for what it does, but there's a couple of things that could be improved upon and some things that other educational games should take note of, uh, especially games like Prodigy. I'm like, I'm shaking my, you don't see me, but I'm shaking mm -hmm. my finger at Prodigy. There's a lot of things that Prodigy does really good. And then there's a lot of things it does really badly <laughs> uh, when it comes to teaching its academic content. But yeah, what I glorify is having the games teach when there isn't a teacher present. Because before COVID, before all of this nonsense, uh, when I was just teaching for a little bit, it was like, oh my God, I gotta keep track of 30 kids. Uh, you know, I teach mathematics, and so it was like some of these kids, uh, you have to sit down with them and actually encourage them to keep going because it, there's a def defeatist attitude that they can never do math, and, it, and you can. You just got to foster it, and video games are amazing at fostering the self-innovation to learn. Yeah, but everybody, absolutely. Everybody here knew that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I don't know if you were uh, following the chat, uh, but you you – uh, gave us a great uh, segue into the, uh, our book. The ETC Press um, has a, a book on games in the uh, learning education games, volume ones, two, and three, which kind of start doing that. And uh, Elena, you were mentioning, uh, we've tried to do some of that before, but it's really hard. What are some of the challenges that we ran into? Um, well, I was going to say that one of the challenges is making sure that the... Um, it fits into the common core standards, or at least the standards that the teachers are um, teaching. Uh, because they have to, whatever lesson plan they use, they have to say that, you know, this lesson plan is using this, this, this in these standards. And I think that would be a good place to start as far as um, making sure that those, the games that you're selecting meet the standards that the teachers need to meet. So. Yeah, that was a huge one. And then also just there's so many different parameters. Uh, it's very difficult. But I mean, one of the things was that, you know, that teachers want things that are free. And we as game designers really want people to pay for games because otherwise we can't possibly make a living. So it's a it's a little bit of a tension. I think um, I was really um, delighted to see the first game that came out, I think this year, which was approved by as a drug, right, by the FDA approved as a treatment, a medical treatment, oh. because, it, you know, and I, I personally have been interviewed by media five times over the last couple months about finally seeing video games as a good, a force for good, as opposed to rotting the minds of young people. So I think, you know, one of the things about COVID is it's caused this shift in the way that people look at games. And now people really do see that games can change behavior in positive ways. And hopefully we can also sort of change attitudes towards you should be willing to buy a good game that's going to do a good job of teaching because it's worth it. It does the job well. 
Uh, but I know any of us that have worked for like NSF or NIH grant funded things, especially in the SBIR track, you know, being able to prove that you can make a game that will, that's marketable, right? That can make money is incredibly difficult because it's almost impossible to get into the academic market. Yeah, it seems so, like that's been a challenge. John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, these are similar challenges I've been seeing. I have a couple of notes and a couple of like theories as to, we, oh, we could try this way, uh, a subscription model similar to textbooks or maybe partner with textbooks in, in some sort of like crazy, like what if theory. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any experience about how textbooks do their publishing and uh, the core curriculum. I do know that's a big hurdle. I think the most I could provide, when I produce one or two of these videos, I, the feedback will be interesting. Because, uh, yeah, the core curriculum sucks and each state has their own weird setup. Uh, and from my experience, I don't think I'll be able to tackle them on. I'll be able to present them as a list and say maybe A, B, C, or A, B, C, D is missing, but that's, it's, it's, a, it's a weird one. Like, I, I want to make these, these videos on my YouTube channel. I want them to have an informative and yet entertaining value because I want teachers from anywhere, from anywhere around the world to say, oh, let me check out this game and see what, uh, what the score is. Oh, I heard this interesting game about uh, typing of the dead. They really like, uh, all my kids are talking about it. Let me see what's up with this game. And I want to be able to provide a lot of information. Typing of the Dead is a game. There's two versions of it. There's one for Steam, and then there's one that's really, really old that came out in 2002. Yada, 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 yada. It does A, B, C, D. It sucks at teaching, but it's a hell of a fun game, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I remember that one. It's a classic. So, and, and Sherry, you mentioned, um, uh, I had a question uh, before we fly past it in the Zoom chat, because you mentioned that uh, some classrooms have been using VR um, to VR chat. Uh, is that, I, I'm actually not familiar with that. Is that a tech that has um, uh, for phones or is it like all HTC and Quest Oculus or like what kind of technology um, are they working through? So I, I just put the link in there. I just realized I didn't put the link. Um, and I think that's correct. <laughs> Let me double check that. Yeah, it's a dot com. OK, so <laughs> Mozilla just came out with Hub. So this was it like a few weeks ago. They kind of just advertised it. Um, and what's happening is that uh, educators are kind of, basically, you can log in there, and it's a free account. and people can go in there and draw and create objects and they can put avatar clothes on and so forth. And some instructors, because um, at certain colleges, they still are looking down on games. So because of this pandemic uh, crisis, there are some instructors who are allowed to kind of soft as a soft entryway into virtual environments. So I just put both of them in there, which is the VR chat. And I probably should put the link in that too. Hold on one second. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I did. I was talking and then I didn't put it on there. But those are two basically free platforms. I'm not suggesting that all the games right, should be free. But the idea is that there are some schools that are still kind of leery about using games. So this is like a soft entryway for instructor to pull students into, into that. And I, I also wanted to add one more as on top of this conversation regarding um, how games teach. Um, it's kind of like Elena already said this, which is that there are many, many parameters and, and it will be, for most instructors, we don't use one game to teach the whole lesson. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. So I'm working with a publisher right now and I'm creating a course. And in this course, we're trying to teach the humanities, but uh, putting recommendations of specific games that teach specific lessons that are appropriate, right, for teaching certain lessons. But it will be a collection of games. It wouldn't be one game or so. I also push for commercial games because a lot of commercial games are better designed. <laughs> so we, we talked about that. And also in response to what you can teach with the game, it kind of depends on the instructor's creativity. I think there is wonderful, I think there's a wonderful value and I didn't know about that the idea of creating a catalog of rating games, which I think that's actually great. And I think it's super valuable. I think if we can pull that off, that would be really great. If there's a group of people who are willing to help, help us with that. But as an example, 
one of the games that I use is Fallout, Fallout Shelter, which is the mobile version of Fallout. And I was using that to teach philosophy. And most people have no idea what I was doing with that, right? It's not, yeah. And it was, I was teaching how the game promotes uh, eugenics, sexism, ageism, uh, all kinds of themes using Plato, <laughs> Plato's theory to discuss that. So it depends on the professor's ingenuity. So that kind of idea with cataloging would also, it would be great to work with instructors besides using some metrics to, to measure them, but instructors can also get feedback, which would make it um, a lot more useful, I think, for that kind of project. That's awesome. Yeah, it's Plato's cav uh, uh, shelter, uh, maybe. So, um, awesome. That's great. Uh, we can keep uh, going around. Aaron, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aaron. Um, this is my first time here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am a gamer first and educator second. Uh, I've been gaming for about 40 years, but I've only been teaching um, if you can include my tutoring, probably about seven years. Um, I, uh, the main thing is that I'm not in video games. I do analog games. Um, so especially role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so I teach, uh, I've taught at private schools. I teach role-playing game design and board game design to middle school students primarily. Um, so I'm very much in about bringing analog games to the classroom and using that as an educational tool. Um, uh, let's see, so I just finished um, teaching using a game um, for a summer school class at the home school that I'm at, and I'll be teaching my role-playing game design class again in the fall. This will be online. Um, I taught it using a virtual tabletop called Roll20, and we use Zoom. Zoom and Roll20 was our um, feedback, so that's how we were getting around that. Um, I am also on the board of directors of the Game Academy, which is a 501c3 based in Northern California. I'm in Los Angeles, by the way, so it's, uh, it's afternoon. I'm in LA. Game Academy is in um, uh, near the San Francisco Bay Area. And Game Academy does uh, role-playing games for summer camp and after-school enrichment. We are all online right now. Um, and um, but the cool thing is we're, we're developing the press release for it, but, but I can announce that um, we partnered up with UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we got a almost $2 million NSF grant to do a, um, a LARP, live action role playing. So if you know that's like tabletop D&D, but you move around. Um, I'm really big in LARPing too. Um, for girls to learn programming, middle school girls, uh, especially um, uh, girls of color and disadvantaged low income stuff in the Bay Area. So. I will be developing and designing their uh, the game for this, um, use, working with UC Santa Cruz. And the idea is it's a three-year uh, program, um, is that there'll be a kit that anyone can get uh, to the classroom and then you can go with it. And I want to de develop not just um, like here's a lesson, but like a perpetual world so that they can kind of create their own sort of material with it and stuff like that. So I'm a game designer. I have uh, publications in the role-playing game thing. Um, I've designed 14, 15 different games for various schools um, to teach standards um, in the classroom. Um, so most of them have been science, um, but I have uh, some history ones that I did. I did an escape room for a high school, um, things like that. Um, so game designer, I make games. I don't have a PhD. I only have a master's and it has nothing to do with education. Um, it's in cinema directing. Um, so, uh, I'm a filmmaker, uh, and, um, what I'm looking to do is, um, uh, help the game Academy, uh, partner with universities. What, what we really need, um, is to, um, cause the partnership with UC Santa Cruz was just, is great. We got a grant out of it. Um, but what we, what we really need is research. So I'd love to team with the research to, to measure the efficacy of this, especially on like a long, long study if possible, because in my heart, anecdotally, I see how amazing games work for kids and, and, and how inspiring and empowering it is, um, how much they enjoy it. Um, even classes like math, like I, I have a math game that I made where, um, like for example, uh, part of me that I'm going off, but that um, there they can, if they do a equation correctly, they can like throw asteroids at other teams. 
Um, and I had eighth grade girls like demanding that I give them more math equations because they wanted to throw asteroids at the boys um, time. And it just struck me. I have like eighth grade girls in the inner city um, of Los Angeles, like saying, give me more math equations. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know how often that happens. Um, so uh, uh, we're looking for research, sorry. So we're looking for researchers that can help us, especially with analog games. So again, we're an analog game company and I do, do analog games. I work briefly for a video game company, but um, my, my bailiwick is, is role-playing games, live action role-playing games. I know Dave Simpkins, um, um, you know, well, we know each other. So, uh, and I have two, um, the leg books that you're talking about, the Karen Trier edited, uh, I'm in volume two. I got a chapter in volume two and a chapter in volume three. The volume three one is using Pathfinder, which is kind of a Dungeon Dragons knockoff, how you can use Pathfinder in the classroom for kind of any sort of lesson. So history, science, math. Um, for me, games, at least role-playing games, are very easy to get the liberal art stuff. So I tackled first and foremost science and math. I'm like, I know I can already do history and language arts. That's easy. But how can we use games for mathematics and, and engineer the STEAM sort of subjects? And did a number of those and find out that, uh, that it, works, it works really well. I've, I've, I had one that I did um, uh, test, play test, at the, again, this school um where uh eighth grade girl was saying this is the first time i actually used the math found a use for the math that i learned um it wasn't just i'm doing math because there's a test but there was there was an in-game reason for using this math equation so um so i'm interested in that um glad to be here thanks for having me um and uh and you know go learning <laughs> Yeah, and congratulations on on the grant. I mean, that's a really great uh, opportunity, especially hearing um, that you've been able to use this as an analog project. Um, at least from my experience, I've had a lot of people. If if they weren't if they weren't convinced about games, they were definitely not convinced about board games. So uh, my experience has been a little bit different. Um, so that's been really great to hear. Yeah, it's it's so, sorry to interrupt. It's it's one of the things like video games. It's taken all the oxygen, I say, the majority of the oxygen. Now, what we were able to do, the partnership with UCSC, honestly, it's using wearable technology. So there's definitely a tech component. So they learn programming, but it's involved. The idea is wearable clothing that uses Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, uh, you know, for LED lights. So the, the, the girls are learning programming and engineering through the technical end of it. Um, but the game is live action. It's not a video game but there is definitely an engineering. They're going to be actually making clothing with, um, you know, components, electronic components in it. So um, uh, I'll, send, I'll send you the link to, it's part of UCSC's um, social, see if I get it right, social emotional technology lab, I believe it is. Catherine As Isbister is the head of it. So I'll send, you, I'll send you the link. I put in the link in the chat here to Game Academy. I'll put in that, um, the link to my homepage uh, and uh, the, the um, SET lab at USC. So. That is so great. Catherine is uh, was my college uh, professor. She got my career started. So uh. she's the yeah she's the she's the head of it. And what how it happened was because they did their wearable tech for a LARP that uh, it was actually I was in the first one. They did LARP for the tech, but I'm always looking for you know LARP stuff. And I saw that they had a paper explaining how they used the wearable tech. And I said, oh, maybe you can do it for a LARP that I was going to do. And we didn't, but then I said, but I'm also on the board of the Game Academy. Maybe we could do a camp because we do summer camps. I go, maybe we could do a camp that uses wearable tech. And that was like three years ago. We got rejected last year, but then we got it this year. Um, and the money's in everything. So it's like, I was just, I, I talked to Catherine yesterday. We had our first meeting yesterday with her. So yeah, it's very cool. Awesome. I think that, that we've got everyone. Uh, yeah, um, Cassandra is, the, is just logged into vi uh, video record as well to help me out. So um, we will pass over her. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's really great. Thank you for introducing everyone. And it sounds like everyone's got some really interesting background. Um, it actually kind of matches up with the uh, data that we collected from the survey, which was, it seemed to be that our at least our, our current body of people um, are about uh, there's us, us a 
let's see, uh, what was it like fifteen uh, percent or so um, in teachers in K through twelve, um, delivering kind of uh, education on the on the ground, and then the rest of the split is half and half between developers in one setting or another and academic uh, um, academics um, who uh, might be teaching in a four year university for or not for profit. Um, so that's really great. It's just interesting to see that it was reflected in uh, who showed up tonight. So that's really cool. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, is, uh, so does anyone have? Oops, sorry. Does anyone have any uh, comments about where? What would be maybe our uh, our first priority uh, or first couple priorities um, uh, based off of? you know, either your own um, experience or, uh, you know, what we can be doing now? Um, should we be maybe responding directly to the, the COVID crisis and or should we be working on maybe some more in class? Uh, like, should we be talking about maybe adapting to COVID standard, uh, to COVID? Like, how do we get tabletop uh, gaming going. Um, there's there's Roll20 and Zoom, and then there's um, also uh, like Tabletop Simulator is what I use in my classroom. Um, but it, it has been a hamper. Um, uh, uh, to It has stopped us from playing games with each other. Like uh, Elena was mentioning, um, you know, I, I play with my students as well. Um, uh, or, or should we be maybe focusing um, on uh, developing events or, you know, anyone have any feedback or thoughts on that? perhaps um, using Zoom as a medium for the actual game itself or whatever um, teleconferencing technology you're using. There's a lot of interesting uh, games that are kind of like games you play in cars on road trips that can, you, that where I've seen work well inside of these like settings, like instead of having an artificial bridge to the analog, uh, like embrace the platform we're in. I don't know if there's things there we can think of. So you're saying like uh, maybe uh, I don't know if you saw that uh, first person shooter chat roulette game, but maybe something in which you're engaging through Zoom as the as the medium. Yeah, that would be an, like mm -hmm. a way to access things. Uh, have a robot arm, right, to move yeah. the pieces or whatever. On um, games like uh, was it Tabletopia is the virtual 3D world that everyone connects to that has support for board games in it. No, oh, I haven't heard of that one. It's really great. Yeah, I played that with my lab a few weeks ago. It's one of many. We've been testing out a whole bunch of these things. Uh, but uh, it had interesting support with sort of like yeah. Second Life abilities to go in and manipulate cards and tokens and everything in 3D. Um, so it was about as close as you could get. Get the power gloves on and you'll be good to go. Yeah, the <laughs> Topia. <laughs> we'll have to focus From... on that. Go ahead, John. Uh, Aaron. Excuse me. Uh, I was on. just saying. It's Tabletopia, Tabletopia, yeah, I'll put the link in. Okay, awesome, thank you. And John, did you have something to, to share as well? Jonathan, no. you're muted. That's a, Yeah, you're muted. All right, I'm back. Well, I, I, I oh, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay, I, it just looked like you were gonna talk. I was gonna talk and then uh, there was a knock at my door. Uh, what was Shoot, what I was going to say. Oh, from my perspective, interviewing teachers in the state of Texas, uh, most of the time they, okay, let me clarify. Speaking to high school teachers in Texas, uh, for a lot of them, they don't, before COVID, okay, this is all before COVID, they don't usually try any program or educational tool unless it's been recommended by a friend. And so, from that research, it's like there's been like you could make some conclusions that word of mouth is extremely powerful uh, in terms of getting people to try different things. Uh, I keep hearing about new video games every single day. As a researcher, I always try to keep track of everything. Like I have like two or three databases of just different catalogs of this this website is for this, this website is for that. There's 500 certain games here, Games for Change just recently did their thing last week. Um, and we have a serious play conference, I think a serious play conference next month. And every single time there's, I always hear about a new game that I never cataloged before. Uh, I, I think it could be handy if there was a database noting 
every single educational piece of software and analog tool out there. Uh, so it's like a Steam, it's a variation of Steam, but sol solely for is like, here's a list of educational games for grade 12 to 10 on so-and-so subjects. These exist, these do not exist. Here are board games to use in this range of topics uh, for age range of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. If people have used commonsensemedia.com, uh, Common Sense Media is a sort of like a parental review, uh, reviewing site for different media. Uh, is Fortnite good for your children? Well, this is what Fortnite does. Is Roblox violent for my kids? And Common Sense Media would provide some clarity as to what Roblox is. Uh, I just, I don't see it for more serious academia meant for older children or something that teachers could use. And I'm just thinking, wow, that would be a handy resource to have if it existed. Yeah, uh, I, I think that that, that uh, in, for, in my experience trying to get into the educational market too, it's been the kind of similar, which is there's a lot of information that teachers have to sift through. Uh, they have to also figure out what they're, you know, what they're going to put in their curriculum and then like they might have to even learn how to play it or there's a lot of just bandwidth issues for faculty for for k through 12 for sure um and and academics as well but um uh specifically for k through 12. um and yeah yeah uh, word of mouth is really helpful but uh, as is uh there's just a challenge of um getting the purse strings as well who who is the one who makes decisions is it the uh is it the fact of the teachers at a school or is it maybe the superintendent of a or you know a, a district manager uh, who might be making those kind of purchasing requests. Um, so yeah, uh, how to access that market is really hard. Um, and then delivering really important um, uh, or uh, affordable technologies as well, I think is a real challenge is um, how is it we can get um, our games into everywhere. I think the Chromebook, uh, Connecticut just recently, I, I think probably because of COVID, um, I, I, I'm not sure uh, specifically, but I know that everyone's been issued a Chromebook. Uh, so standardization of, of computers is really good, but Chromebooks don't necessarily run like the highest end things or anything at all sometimes. Um, so there's a lot of challenges. Uh, I, th I think you also, you mentioned mapping um, uh, a, a place where we could maybe map games that meet the standards. Maybe that's a really good way. Uh, so for instance, um, for the NSF project I was working on, we were looking at the NGSS standards, which is the National Science Guidance Standards. Um, and uh, uh, that was a place where we would uh, maybe we should be mapping games to those and say, hey, this is my lesson plan and here's how I approached it and maybe a way for for play people to share um, just because a lot of times the ingenuity also comes from those K through 12 teachers as well. They make their own stuff up sometimes, so. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a interesting question. I, uh, from my experience, I'm no expert. I would say it would be best if teachers are able to submit uh, recommendations. Oh, I would like this game to be added. I would like to, for this board game to be added under category, this is a tool rather than a game, and this tool is good at doing A, B, C, and maybe just provide them like just questionnaires to fill out under like a genre, under a subject, under an age range, uh, how many students did you get under it, so on and so forth. It's, it's a weird cataloging process uh, that I see going on in my head, but it's I just, uh, I don't know. It, I see it crazy fun to have, especially for me, instead of me keeping track of everything by myself <laughs> and me having to f filter out all the bandwidth. Scott, chime in that uh, that's kind of the thing that, come, I mean, sort of a mashup of something that would be like the curating of a TED Talks type of thing with the, um, uh, the process that like a Wikimedia producing a Wikipedia type of uh, database type of thing. And yeah, like that. That's that's a good that's a good analogy. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that uh, and well, one thing from the um, you mentioned something coming up next month. I'm not sure. I know there's like the 
uh, GDC uh, summer thing coming up in August or whatever. Uh, but um, the Series Play one I went to last month, uh, the, the talks about there was there was somebody who had a lot of experience with like the ESA and uh, Entertainment Software Association and was talking about like how they got things going and and that tying into um, even like credentialing and things like that. I, I mean, it seems like it could all all this could tie into like the the rating of different aspects of games or or different teachers, educators, learners, whoever um, doing different levels of kind of even like a Rotten Tomatoes version of or whatever, but, but just the breakdown of, of like professional reviewers and, and researchers on efficacy as maybe a separate category or combined. And then um, players, learners, reviews could be a value. Um, but, but the thing that came out of the this, there was a, a session where um, there were a bunch of people from different serious games kind of purposes, but a, a few, especially in, in education, um, filaments, uh, Dan White was there, Jesse Shell and uh, Tori Van Voris, I think is her last, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but uh, from, I think, uh, Second Avenue Learning, I'm not sure, but, um, and and just talking about all the issues, um, and one of the things that seems like is a challenge is that the, sort of the model that's being gone on is very much in the, it was uh, what Eleanor was bringing up earlier, I think, um, the tension between everybody needing to make money, <laughs> and people who need the product not having that much money. Um, I think something like this needs to be not so much in the model of that trade association or for-profit model because that runs into, I think people tried like a Steam for Education. I think like Glass Lab Games was one of them that I saw. There's a good article out there by, um, I can't remember his name, but it's How, How Learning Games Get Funded um, that has references that. And and there's there, that gets tied up so much into like doing a marketplace and sales and all that side of things. It's a huge money um, requirement. Also, so um, if there was some way of, of like crowdsourcing and and blending together people who have other forms of ongoing work they're doing, whether it's with the universities, nonprofits, and then. The, the, the businesses that are able to keep sustainable have a vested interest in, in contributing to making something like that going. That seems like the kind of bigger system that would be awesome, <laughs> is, what, is what I'm thinking. There's a lot of ideas. To, <laughs> I want to add to what David just said. First of all, uh, it was very, let me, let me step back for a second and say that I, I currently work with the USDOE, as well as the Colorado Department of Higher Education in Colorado. And the biggest push right now, where the funding is, is that the USDOE is very, very interested in uh, credentialing and skills, kind of what, what Dave was just talking about, right? And one of the complaints <laughs> that they have, the people who are evaluating whether to give funding to educational games, is how can an educational game demonstrate that when a student is playing it, they actually, or the learner played it, that they actually earned the skill that they, they supposedly supposed to have gotten from the game. So one trend, right, in developing games is to actually create assessment inside the game itself. So that's something to think about, and probably a lot of us already figured that out, but assessment is actually pretty important as part of the game design, which is probably at the end of a lesson, like many assessments throughout the game. Another thing, which probably, again, I, excuse me if everyone knows this already, but another trend is right now is using blockchain technology, right, to uh, make the back end for games so that you can trade asset outside of game. Why am I bringing this up? If you go to the USDOE website, okay, blockchain is one of the highest priority <laughs> for the USDOE because they want they want to use blockchain technology to document skills and credentials for educational future so that students can actually document the credential, not just from a university, but from something like Coursera, uh, Udemy, all kinds of platforms uh, on a single application like a uh, self-sovereign identity app that they can actually demonstrate they learned all these skills. If a game incorporate or use 
some parts of blockchain technology in, in, in developing it. The USDOE, man, I should give you guys all the links, but the USDOE just collaboration with ACE to release a $1 million grant to any commercial company who is trying to develop any kind of blockchain-based education software. So whether it's a game or an application, yeah. So so I I will put the links up. Let me find it. But that's that's the piece is we need to remember that there needs to be assessment in a game, not just the game claims or the educator claims that my students learn something that we actually have some data to show um, departments. And that will give you more um, appeal, more persuasive power when you talk to those who are making decisions. And most of the colleges that I work with, the people who are making decisions are like those who are in the instructional design department, <laughs> people who are in the instructional design who are overseeing the technology. They tend to be the people who are making decisions. And yes, you have to say, how does this connect with teaching? But if you can show how this assesses this particular thing, they usually do purchase software that way. So that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I've found a lot of uh, funding sources tend to come from not things called video game grant funding organization 101. Um, uh, you know, so that's uh, definitely like how you, how do you work the into the grant system, the things you need to do, even if it, you know, is only part of your whole project or if you're working on an independent company. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll post links and stuff um, to everything. Uh, Aaron, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there, there, I'm, there's a couple of things um, that I'm going to mention about the topics that came up and I'm going to try and work my way backwards. Um, uh, first is is on assessment. Um, so one of the big things uh, with assessment, at least with video games, is that there's transference. So the skill that you're supposedly learning in the video game actually transfers to a not video game um, basis for that skill. So in other words, if you're, you know, Math Blaster was the famous one that there was a study that like they did Math Blaster and that just meant that they were good at Math Blaster, not that they were good at math, they were good at the video game. So that you have to be able to take whatever skill you're supposed to be learning outside of that game, um, um, you know, condition and do that elsewhere and take the skill. So that's really big. When I'm designing games, um, I, I design for assessment because that's a really big thing. It's it's more it's easier with video games than it is for analog games that I'm doing because a lot of it's observational. So what I'm doing oftentimes is that. Um, the students have to do a presentation of some kind or they have to write something or they keep a journal or some kind of record of some kind, whether it's an oral or a visual or written or artistic or, you know, whatever it is presentation, but absolutely assessment is really big, which is one reason why I want to partner with um, university partners to do research to measure this and see if it's um, if it's working. Obviously, I know in my heart that it is because I've seen it, but that's just an anecdote. I'm not a, you know, scientific researcher and I want some scientific research. Um, second thing, moving back on the stuff. Um, the database, I think, is an awesome idea to do something. One thing I've noticed um, with teachers, uh, I was at a game design conference for Reacting to the Past. If you guys are familiar with the RTTP from Barnard College, they use LARPs to teach history, uh, college liberal stuff. They've been doing it for like 15 years. Um, most of the professors who were there were history professors and not game designers. And so they're like, I'm going to make this game about this history event that I'm a specialist in. But the game seemed for me as a game developer and designer, it's like, oh, that sounds like a crappy game. Um, and, and what I would recommend in this, if you're doing something that's database, I think it's, I think that it's really important to pair game designers with teachers, right? Like I'm a game designer. I would love to design games for you guys, for your specific, specific skills or, or whatever you're learning, but I don't know, you know, standard, like all the standard stuff, like I look at Common Core and I'm like, okay, all of the games I make, all the standards apply. So one of the things that I can do, but that I like having help is like, okay, I'm making the game and then can you guys help me fit this into the standards? Because these ga analog games especially are so flexible and so fluid that it's easy to apply any standard to it. So I was using, I have to revamp them um, to the next gen standards, but I designed like six science LARPs for eighth grade, uh, eighth grade students using um, California science standards. And I basically just took a standard and they go, okay, you have to learn 
about gravity. And then, okay, and then I made a game about gravity. So I would love to work with a teacher at whatever level and say, I want a game that is doing these skills and these standards. And I say, okay, and then I will make a game around that. So partnering those two between the instructor and the game designer who knows that would help because those are two different skill sets that learn. I also think it'd be great to help teach teachers to use game as a pedagogy and not as much taken off the shelf game, but that they are making their game for their class. So one of the things that like, that is really big for me and kind of why I skew towards analog games um, is um, that uh, each teacher has their own class and it's unique every year, right? You have a unique batch of students at different levels at different times. And the idea of me for textbooks, I kind of rebelled against textbooks of like a bunch of, you know, a, a committee of very smart people three years ago in a city far away have designed the lesson plan for a school they're never going to be at with a student body that they're never going to see. And that's going to work. Um, you know, you don't know each year is different. So COVID, so are all our textbooks, how are they going to apply? How are you going to be doing your textbook now in this COVID situation? And so I'm very much for empowering the teacher who's actually in the classroom to have the tools to adjust that game, whatever it is, to that class that year. And that's very difficult from my perspective um, to program a game, video game like that, right? Because video game is programmed and here are your limits. Whereas an analog game, the limits are the teacher's improv skills. So as a dungeon master playing D&D &D and the kids say, do something crazy, you just go, okay. I had a kid in the game I just played, he wanted to be half potato. His, his character was half potato. He was a cook, he was playing a cook and he goes, I want my cook to be half potato. And I kind of pause for a second, I go, okay, fine, <laughs> you know, and it's okay. And then I'm like, but do you cut pieces of your own potato off when you're cooking things? You know, it got on this whole thing about potatoes and potatoes grow and, you know, it, it suddenly turned, and this is what Game Academy does. It suddenly turned into a lesson about potatoes, about gardening, completely unprompted because this kid wanted half of his character to be potato. So he was great. I love this kid. He's great. Um, so, so professional development, I think is a really cool thing along the lines of not just how teachers can use games off the shelf games in their classroom, but how they can, and the second level for me would be, how can you hack that game to skew it? So you take an off the shelf game, now hack it. Um, and then hopefully get to a level where you're developing and designing your own games as an instructor or something, you know, years down the road, you've been teaching the off the shelf game, then you've skewed it and hacked it and modified it. And now you're making your own. And this is basically the same track that I took with role playing games. I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. I ran the set modules just as they wrote. Then I start customizing it and, and hacking the module. And now I write my own, right? It's, it's a progress of years. I would love for teachers to be doing that and using games really as a, as a pedagogical tool and, and empowering because the game is so powerful, but really empowering the teachers as well so that they're not, okay, I have this game and this is the game that works all the time every year. Um, next, you, and this is my last thing. Thank you for indulging me. Um, you were talking about like, how do we teach in COVID? Uh, so the homeschool I'm at, they want to do a, um, the headmaster wants to do a, a, a LARP an event in a park, socially distanced, like in a park or something, like you have to get these kids out in the outside world and stuff. And I've done a number of scavenger hunts for fun, right? Like road rally scavenger hunts, you're going around and you gotta take pictures and stuff like that, um, which is difficult for grade school kids, like K-12 when you don't have cars and now you still gotta get the teachers around. Um, but I wonder if there is some way for me to design something where you're outside and doing stuff. And so uh, uh, you're getting away from the Zoom, you're getting away from the screen and doing something like that, maybe in small teams, or like you, you go around and then you check in with a teacher at a place and you go or something like that. Anyway, haven't designed that yet. Um, I'm also was thinking like, hey, what would the Khan Academy look like? So you take all your lessons and then you go to school in batches. So small amounts of students, like six to 10 in the classroom or whatever the, you could socially distance everybody and then they do their homework and their lab work, but they're only coming in like two, three times a day or a week. I'm sorry, two, three times a week. Um, and the other thing is that, that I recommend is as tough as it is, 
using Zoom and everything right now and stuff, there's, there's some advantages to this. And I found this with my regular tabletop role-playing game. So I got a regular tabletop role-playing game. It's the Call of Cthulhu system. Um, we play every Sunday. And what I do is I get other people to be non-player characters, right? I get actors to play the other character. So I don't have to do it all the time. Um, um, but this advantage, I realized, oh, this is actually really cool. I can get other people in the Zoom. I can get other people from around the world. So the current NPC guy is in England. Um, so he's like, it's like 2 a.m. I have to go to bed. Um, but that, that, use this ability of zoom to have guest speakers possibly come in to give a talk to your students and they could be anywhere in the world right depending on the the time zone and stuff there's definitely these advantages that if we're stuck online like let's take advantage of the stuff that, that we have to do so um i think that helps like i had a birthday party and and normally it would be here but I was actually able to talk to like old friends I haven't, you know, college roommates I haven't seen because they're on the other side of the country and they were at my birthday party and that was actually really cool. So there, there's some tough times, but I think there's solutions to all this stuff that I think could be really cool. So. That's awesome. Man. Okay. You. I got chat stuff. Yeah. I, and uh, Matt, great comment. Oh, it was John? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I came in like halfway through on, on that. Uh, the uh yeah a lot of what you have to say i absolutely preach uh the big issue around assessment in games is it transferable this is a hundred percent a design a game designer problem uh fortunately uh for teachers to be a teacher you got to go through you got to go to college you got to have a series of tests you got to make sure that you're registered you got to jump through all these hoops to finally be capable of saying, hey, I could teach in high school because of A, B, and C. For game designers, you could pick out anyone to be a game designer. It, it, the game designer could be anyone. But not everyone knows how to be a good game designer. And when it, what winds up happening a lot is if you have a game designer without a subject expert, in this case, the teacher, uh, they will make a game that's almost fun to play but the skills aren't transferable or you you can't do a proper assessment like uh like that was previously stated uh you do need in all situations i'm just repeating is the do you need a subject matter expert or instructional designer or teacher along with an experienced game designer because there's a lot of different games out there and the more experienced the game designer is at understanding what makes each type of game fun what makes a card game fun compared to a board game? What makes a platformer fun compared to a racing game? And all these, like, what makes a role-playing... Role-playing games are amazing, by the way. They're, like, quintessential in fostering empathy in players and making sure that they care fundamentally about whatever is being pre presented in front of them. It's how books work, it's how movies work, and that's how you get educational games to work, for at least students to care about what's happening. Uh, but yeah, it's yeah. this blockchain information is pretty new. I wish I was able to hear all the information that was stated because <laughs> I had to I had to miss a little bit of that. But is this going to be recorded in any way? Yeah, absolutely. We've got to record it and we'll play it back as well. And of course, the links that we're going to provide, we'll, we'll pass around. And hopefully this will also help. And I appreciate everyone's help for being able to be here live and have a good discussion. Uh, but this will hopefully nice. help spur our online conversations as we get things going um, and start really engaging with everyone, especially now that it's the summer and like I'm looking at my, you know, my curriculum for the fall and I'm also designing an RPG for my game production class where they, I'm teaching business, but you know, might as well do it with an RPG uh, paper and pen. Uh, so it's, it'll be really uh, great to start those conversations. Uh, and also I, I'm, I'm realizing that we're coming to the end of our time. So uh, unless anyone else had anything specific that they really wanted to get out there uh, beforehand, I was thinking we could wrap up around now um, and uh, hopefully carry this conversation on later. Um, but uh, I'll throw one thing out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the game, one of the big game design trend, not just in learning games, but one of the big game design trend is using a platform as in, you know, the Apple Arcade folks, Apple Arcade is the idea, right? And I'll, I'll put the link there Taylor. But the idea is that you have a collection of games and the players play a subscription 
for that collection of games. So you don't have to get quarter and dime on microtransactions and any kind of unethical stuff that mobile games are doing right now. So eventually I think there could be an influence in the learning game community where we create a platform that might be a subscription model. So you have a group of games to sell to university. Why? Because most universally, for example, Bright Fuse, which is D2L, they have games that are actually in the platform, but they went with third party provider that provide a collection of games. So it's very hard to sell them one single game. But if you have a collection of these games, work with educators, work with professional developers. I mean, that could be a future direction. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds really cool. I, I, uh, I, I think that we should make it so for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. Cause then it, it becomes easier. So that, that does, does seem good. I don't know if Amos one's been working on Apple arcade, but there it's an interesting bunch. I liked my Gamefly subscription. So, uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Neverwinter Nights, as I, we're reading some comments. So, um, uh, that, yeah, there's a lot of times where people can maybe have some, you know, entry level tools, especially like you, I think someone else mentioned Roblox, um, which is a very entry level, even for uh, teachers. Like I've seen teachers implement uh, curriculum through Roblox because they can handle the amount of, um, you know, design and development work. So, uh, those kind of games seem to also be really uh, useful. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it depends. So yeah, that seems really great. We seem we 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 talked about um, reviewing educational games and uh, possible directions. Um, also, the nailing down the uh, connections between researchers and small developers. So, uh, does anyone else have? Sorry, uh, does anyone else have anything to add? I I got one more interesting thing to add. Uh, I'm thinking more about the assessment issue in video games and educational video games and making games that are capable of assessing. It's, it is probably the biggest challenge uh, that currently stops educational games from taking off. I spoke with Dan Norton uh, from Filament Games for a little bit, and he's the head honcho there. He's a big dog. Uh, CCO, I think. Creative consultant? No, creative? I, I don't know what the acronym for CCO is. <laughs> but uh, Chief creative officer, I think. Yes. Yes, there we go. Uh, the quote unquote not enemy but the standards that stop educational games from becoming all that they could be uh it almost make it ungame like i think the best way i could go is with an example let's say you have flat data that you have to teach flat data meaning you had to teach you had to get the students to memorize the periodic table of elements and that was it like that, that that's all you got to teach them Making a game out of that is going to suck. The game is going to be no good. It's going to be equivalent of like glorified uh, flashcards. Um, however, if you have a data that is not flat, but is very malleable, it's very gray, has a lot of in different interesting factors, uh, learning about how businesses work, learning about how politics works, how voting works, uh, you will have a very, very interesting game but then it starts to get a little bit murky when it comes to measuring or quantifying it or giving it a pedagogy score for a common curricular or common core because what may make the game funner may not align with those standards. It's going to be possibly the biggest issue for the next couple of years about really nailing that assessment down. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I know that it's one of the things that um, uh, is part of the evaluation process and the grants that I've been applying to, at least, and um, certainly assessment and uh, is, is really important, uh, especially because there's so many definitions of assessment as well for different fields. So like, how do you how do you teach us, uh, you know, if they got the concepts um, that they need to through, you know, social science courses, especially it can be difficult. So yeah, I, I just throw in there too, that yeah. uh, obviously, I'd rubrics and, and the way different ways of I mean basically the human element of, of teaching and assessing that at a certain point you can't really program and you can't replace with with a game's uh, data or whatever I mean you can use the data to help that but it's something that is, is where um, another element that uh, is coming out of instructional design it's like 
this point a couple decades old, but um, um, Professor of Indiana, Charles Ruglis has this idea kind of for an LMS, but not LMS because it's it's basically um, a paradigm industrial education or whatever, um, assembly line students, whatever, um, oriented toward administration and management, not towards the learner or the teacher um, or the instructor, professor, whatever. Um, but the idea, it's this thing called PIES, P-I-E-S, uh, uh, so again, a minute ago, it's like a personalized integrated education system, something like that. But the idea is kind of like a um, what I think people have been trying in various ways, even like way back to I don't know, very low tech and kind of uh, limited uh, Yville, which I just met the founder of it uh, over the chat at, at uh, Games for Change, and it's kind of interesting because it's. Um, but then, like even I don't know, people trying to do an integrated. Um, thing of even like teaching about game design through game design, like uh, game star mechanic or something like that. I don't know, there's all these different directions, but the, but the idea of um, something that is uh, like you're talking about, uh, John, more than the uh, flat, more than the flat data, everything, what's about problem solving, critical thinking, all the, and learning to learn, all these things that are, um, and far transfer and all these things that are more crucial to the games are, sort of excellent at in a lot of in or it sort of made to be find a way to make them into having a system that could be you're you're in it you're in that system and then when you need to dive into like the flat data that is also more easily accessible um memorization and rote practice and things like that um there's there's that there, there's it's kind of like kind of mini games type of thing you can jump into and then jump back out into the the more, um, I guess, the open world type of context and ties back to also what was being talked about with the flexibility of pen and paper, tabletop role play and all that and LARPing and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, the ways to tie is to not be so rigidly tied into one form or another is another thing that I think all these, and then, yeah, and then curating and standard, uh, developing standards for all these things is something that um, is a challenge, but I think is the the criteria and the, the the models and frameworks are there in a lot of ways. We just have to kind of like pull them together and share them, I guess, is, is what I'm in, I guess. Yeah, and I, I think exactly the kind of stuff that we need to be doing in the future now. So that, that seems like a, a really good start um, to what we need to be thinking about. And um, so, so yeah, no, that's been really helpful and, uh, and thank you all very much. It's, uh, we're just wrapping up now. Um, so thank you all very much for being here and for participating in this conversation. Like I mentioned, this will be posted around and, uh, I, yeah, I, I love meeting everyone and hearing about how people are working. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, just me and my, my partner and my dog here. So, uh, it's, uh, nice to see some friendly faces this summer, uh, especially. So, I uh, appreciate you coming up on webcam as well um, to chat. So um, if that's all, we'll probably be holding more opportunities to kind of connect in different ways. Um, and uh, based off of your feedback, we're going to go back to as the steering committee and figure out what we need to do next, what would be the best way to do the next thing. So thank you so much for uh, for coming. And yeah, I, I hope that you'll be engaged on social media platforms um, and uh, hit us up. So I'll talk to you soon. So thank you all.